uh, it was very enjoyable. It made for a long day, but yet, uh, you know, unfortunately that uh, Memphis Oklahoma City game didn't come down to that uh, white knuckler late last second shot in the fourth quarter. But uh, you know, for three quarters, it was a very good game. Absolutely. All right, let's get thoughts on Heat Bulls game one before we get to that Western Conference game. I saw something today that it was like the most watched Eastern Conference vinyl game in a long, long time. It was a thriller. What did you take from last night's game? Oh, I take that that game was won on the defensive end by the Chicago Bulls in the third quarter. Think about this. Everybody was talking about how this was going to be a grind them out game. But then you go back and you look at the score, it was 48-48 to 48 at half. You're like, wow, man, they're on pace to score 96 points. Nobody thought this was going to happen. But then things came to a screeching halt in the second half for the Miami Heat. If you look at what happened to the Heat, they scored 15 in the third, 19 in the fourth. But to go back to the start of the second half, the first three possessions by the Miami Heat were at the rim. Bosch, Wade, Bosch. And what does Tom Thibodeau do? He calls timeout. They get together, they huddle up, they talk about what's going on, how you can't just allow guys to run down the middle. Because, you know, if you go back and you look at the box score, Adam, you look at, uh, you know, as far as points in the paint, the Heat did a better job, 46-38, because they were getting to the rim, you know, with ease early on. But the Bulls changed that, and it was that third quarter. You know, you look at it, well, the, the Miami Heat went 7-15. of 15. Yeah, they went 7-15, of 15, but they started off 3-3. Three of three. And then from that point on, they only went 4 of 12. But it was the second chance opportunities, the Bulls hammering the boards. They picked up six offensive rebounds in that third quarter. Those six offensive rebounds led to 10 second chance points. They knocked down four threes to only one for Miami. And they got to the free throw line four times to none for Miami. That totally changed the momentum of this game, how this game was being played. And you saw the Bulls' defense that you fully expected to see from the start of the game that was somewhat porous in the first half. ESPN Radio NBA analyst Will Purdue, our guest here, Neft at night on 97.1 The Fan. Uh, How worried should Miami be? I don't think they're that worried. I mean, listen, you've got to remember and go back to the Boston series. Miami won their first two games at home, and they were pretty impressive in those wins, even though when you looked at the box score, you know, the, the, the deficits weren't that big. But if you go to game three, the first game in Boston, that's probably the worst game that, that uh, Miami's played in the playoffs, even including what they've done against uh, Philly and even this game tonight. Because you got to go back and say, hey, this game was tied at halftime. But that Boston game, three, they got blown out. They came back. They rebounded well in the sense that uh, you know they put that behind them and they won the next two games and they won that series in five. You're still in a situation where Miami can step up possibly win that game on Wednesday, it's 1-1, and they've now taken away the home court advantage for the Miami Bulls, headed back to Miami for two games. But game two is pretty huge, right? Oh, there's no doubt about it, because it, all of a sudden, Boston win. I mean, I'm sorry, Chicago wins game two. Now, all of a sudden, it's a, it's a best of five series. And you're telling me that the Miami Heat are going to win four out of five against the Chicago Bulls? I find that hard to believe. Yeah, I certainly do as well. Joined by ESPN Radio NBA analyst Will Purdue here on 97.1 The Fan Neft at night. All right, let's switch over to the Western Conference final. Oklahoma City beat Memphis. That was in the semifinal, obviously. I really feel like, though, you got to give the Memphis Grizzlies a little bit of credit. They weren't expected to be there. They certainly hustled and, and played their tails off till kind of the bitter end. Well, they did. I mean, you got to remember, they were the eighth seed. But surprisingly, if you go back and you look at that whole thing, they rested their starters the last two games of the regular season. Now, when I talked to Lionel Hollins, I did uh, their their game one against Oklahoma City. And I tried to get him to, to admit something in the sense that, did you guys really not care about winning those last two games because you wanted to stay in that eighth spot because you thought you matched up well with the San Antonio Spurs? And he just kind of chuckled and uh, would not really admit to anything. But, you know, he just said, hey, it, it, we play who we play. And... You saw a team that played very well. They beat the number one seed in the West in the San Antonio Spurs, and they beat them handily. They were able to, you know, deal with the pressure of, you know, winning on the road and at home. And they put the Oklahoma City Thunder, a team that they shouldn't even be playing against, to the seventh game. But now the question is, Adam, is now from this point on, how do they live up to the expectations? Because prior to this season – they hadn't even won a playoff game. They'd been to the playoffs on two separate occasions, but they hadn't even won a playoff game. 
Now they not only win a playoff game, they win a series. They almost get a chance to go to the Western Conference Finals. They obviously have some deficits that need to be addressed. But all of a sudden, as you as you and I were talking last week, they got a point guard in Mike Conley who I thought played very well throughout this whole series. He did exactly what a point guard is supposed to do. He facilitated. He had very few turnovers. He looked to score when necessary, but I don't think he really forced shots. He came into his own. Then you talk about, you know, O.J. Mayo. Nice job by the coach of bringing him in off the bench, him, you know, stepping up and playing his role. Mark Gasol, uh, you know, Zebo from Michigan State. All of a sudden now you look at this team's got some pieces. And this is a team that, uh, you know, didn't even have their best player in Rudy Gay. Mm -hmm. And now the main thing to say about this is one of the things that, you know, a lot of people talked about Rudy Gay, as good as he was, somewhat selfish. You think that now as he's sitting on the bench and he sees what this team does without him, he's probably going to change how he plays. And he's probably going to change his approach a little bit because a little bit of him said, hey, I'm replaceable if I'm not careful. So I expect this team to be better next year. But now, as a young team, can they live up to the expectations? And this is probably one of those teams that if this lockout that starts July 1st goes for a long time, this could actually hurt them because they are a young team. And who's going to be the veteran player that steps steps up and says, you know, hey, we need to have practices on our own. We need to stay together. Let's not fracture because, you know, we got a good thing going here, and we're on the precipice of possibly being more than just a playoff team in the future. That certainly makes sense. Joined again by NBA, uh, ESPN Radio, NBA analyst Will Purdue, our guest here on 97.1 The Fan. It's going to be a dandy of a Western Conference Finals. Who has the advantage, Dallas because they've had so much time off, or Oak City because they're fresh and ready to go and really essentially have no time off? I guess it depends on how you look at it. It's, there's there's a, a pros and cons to each. I mean, I think Dallas needed some time, but the question is who, again, you're talking about what, member of that team and they have a veteran team was it Dirk Nowitzki was it Jason Kidd was it Jason Terry you can't necessarily depend on the coach the question with them was how do you keep up that intensity how do you keep up that momentum I think personally they've lost the momentum but during those practice days how hard were their practices how hard did they practice was there somebody amongst that team and again not the coach yelling at guys but somebody amongst that team saying hey we got to practice harder we got to go longer you know, we're going to play against a young team, whether it be Memphis or Oklahoma City, while they're waiting, that's, that's going to be hungry, that's going to look to push us. I was with the Chicago Bulls when we had similar situations, but I was fortunate enough to play with Michael Jordan, who was very competitive and would get on guys in practice if he didn't think they were practicing hard enough. Do the Dallas Mavericks have somebody like that? And, yes, they'll be somewhat rusty, but how long does it take them to shake it off? The first six minutes, the whole first quarter, the whole first half? I still think regardless of who wins this first game, and as you pointed out, I think maybe Oklahoma City does have the slight advantage because they're just continuing to play, and that's what you you love to do as a player as long as you're winning. Let's keep playing. But I still think Dallas wins this series in six. I'll tell you what, we're looking at some uh, pretty good conference finals here. Uh, There's no doubt about it. Uh, You know, you you talk about you kind of have the old guard and the Dallas Mavericks and Dirk Nowitzki, Jason Kidd, Jason Terry, a team that's been to the finals but yet lost to – The Miami Heat, now you have the new guard in Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, uh, you know, a guy that's actually stepped up and played well since the the trade of Jeff Green in order to get, uh, you know, these guys that they've made. And and, uh, James Harden, I mean, he stepped up and and picked up the scoring slack, and you saw that in Game 7 against Memphis. Kendrick Perkins was the guy they traded for. He started to help out. I mean, that that in itself on the West is going to be good. And then you just talk about athletes and scores and, uh, you know, young coaches. There's a lot going on here in the, 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 excuse me, the dynamic of the NBA, or should we say the new NBA. Well, great stuff. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Enjoy, and we'll talk to you soon. Well, Adam, I appreciate it. I'm always glad to uh, push the NBA in college towns like Columbus.